Everybody got quiet. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, it's not, you, you don't have to get quiet. Yes, as long as you're quiet, I will seize the moment. I'm Alex Kesar, and let me welcome you to this afternoon's entertainment, um, which is sponsored by the Inequality Program, the Tobin Project, and the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation. The occasion for this event, as you all know, is the publication of a new book by Jacob Hacker and Paul Pearson, a book entitled Winner Take All Politics, How Washington Made the Rich Richer and Turned Its Back on the Middle Class. It's a subtle title. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> doesn't telegraph its point of view at all. Um, this is a subject actually of, of great interest, as, as an aside for those of us who live in Massachusetts and are hit hard by the alternative minimum tax, um, but the subject of great interest, um, as we have witnessed in the last couple of years, the return really to pugnacious power of the financial industry and national politics, and as we watch the unfolding of the current congressional election campaign, in which, to all appearances at least, the rich seem to be investing heavily with a very good chance of getting a very good return. Winner Take All Politics is a classic crossover book, as they say in the publishing industry. It is aimed in part at the community of scholars and other professionals who do this sort of thing for a living, <laughs> like a lot of the people in this room. The book draws heavily on existing scholarly research and intervenes in various interpretive debates among academics. At the same time, the book is actually trying to reach a much broader audience and to influence popular understandings of contemporary American political life. Accordingly, it's actually it's written in an utterly accessible um, manner. It's a very highly readable book, very readable book, a pleasure to read. It's peppered with the sports metaphors that have become epidemic in American social science. Um, <laughs> And it contains, more unusually, it is filled with references to films, most of which I haven't seen, which made the book less accessible to me. But most of you probably will have seen more of these films than I have. It's an analysis of the book is an analysis of this particular moment in the history of the political economy of the United States. This moment, I'm a historian, so this moment is the last 30 years and how um, we got to there. Um, and in broader intellectual terms, um, the book, it seems to me, is a contemporary effort to address a large and persistent question that has been out there in different forms for much of the 20th century, a question which uh, Swedish scholar Jörn Therborn posed in an essay written about 35 years ago when he was actually talking about Marxism and, and, and democracy, but trying to deal with one of the fundamental issues, contradictions, paradoxes, which is how do we explain how a small minority class manages to stay in power um, when electoral democracy exists. Uh, we're happy to have with us, as you can see here, the authors of this new book, Jacob Hacker and Paul Pearson. Jacob is the Stanley Reeser Professor of Political Science at Yale. Paul is the John Gross Professor of Political Science at UC Berkeley. They both also have a lot of other titles, but I'm limiting this introduction to one title per person. Um, both Paul and Jacob have authored numerous works separately and together about US politics, institutions, and social policy. They will, they will be speaking first uh, and offer something of an introduction to the book. <laughs> Commenting on the book will be two members of the Harvard faculty, Theda Scotchpole, the Victor Thomas Professor of Government and Sociology, who has written widely on too many subjects to name and is really one of the most influential social scientists of our generation. I can say our generation because we were exact contemporaries in graduate school. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that was only five years ago. <laughs> um, um, and Archon Fung, the Ford Foundation Professor of Democracy and Citizenship at the Kennedy School, and himself the author of many well-known studies of the institutions of democracy. Again, the format is uh, Paul and Jacob will speak first for about 25 minutes, then uh, Theta and Archon uh, will offer comments for about 15 minutes each. Then we will open this up to questions uh, from the audience. And at near the end, as we approach uh, closing time at about 6 o'clock, I will try to give uh, Paul and Jacob a chance to offer some response to the arrows that have been hurled uh, against them. And my role henceforth 
will be to control the clock with my customary Stalinist manner. Um, so with that, with that said, let me, I don't know which of you, the two of you, uh, Jacob, the floor is yours. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, I just, hold on just a second. I've been asked, I have a second piece of paper. I've been asked to announce, for those of you uh, who sh should be of interest, that tomorrow in this room, at exactly the same time, there will be an event on the new American economy uh, sponsored by the Scholars Strategy Network in which a variety of people, the uh, welcome is, for, is by Theta and a variety of, well, I don't want to take the time to list these, but a variety of well-known and interesting economists will be talking about the state of the American economy. Uh, so if you have nothing to do tomorrow for it, I recommend it. Uh, Jacob. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, I, I have to say, yes, the title, the title definitely has a point of view. I, um, you uh, would, would be impressed to know that we actually talked them down to this version. Um, we're working, and, and this, is a par this is a crossover book, and I have to say crossover books have some perils. I have an image of myself uh, and Paul sort of balancing over a chasm, um, but hopefully we'll stay uh, uh, above the, uh, above the, the gap uh, in, in what follows. This is just a, a real pleasure and honor to be here. I have a deep tie um, to Harvard. I was an undergraduate here. My thesis advisor is here in the front, uh, Andy Martin. Um, and uh, I was actually a junior fellow at the Harvard Society of Fellows for a few years um, back in the late, late 1990s and early 2000s. And um, this is a, an, an amazing group. Um, we couldn't ask for a, a better setting to talk about this book. And we're going to. I'm going to try to um, do two things in what follows. One is to, to try to give you a, a broad overview of what we're doing in the book and, and really focus a bit on some of the more intellectual or academic uh, discussions that, um, that we're engaged in um, without, I hope, uh, shortchanging some of the entertaining sports or uh, TV or film metaphors. Uh, I'll also try to keep it very brief. And whenever I am uh, charged with um, speaking for a short period of time, I'm reminded of an evaluation I received uh, when I was a new assistant professor at Yale, and it, it, it itself was brief. It said, Professor Hacker, if I had just 15 minutes to live, I'd want to spend it in your class. Because that way it would seem like an hour. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to try to keep, I'm going to try to keep this brief and hopefully it'll seem as brief as it is. For those of you who've read Larry Bartel's uh, excellent 2008 book on uh, politics and inequality, you may remember this quote uh, from our former Treasury Secretary, Hank Paulson. Rising inequality is simply an economic reality, and it's neither fair nor useful to blame any political party. Now, we can obviously chuckle at this because it's pretty clear which party was being blamed uh, back when Paulson spoke in 2006. But I think this sums up actually a pretty strong uh, consensus view, at least until recently, among uh, serious students of America's inequality problem. Um, we have quotes, uh, not in the book, but in some of our other writing, uh, from Greg Mankiw uh, on the one hand, and Brad DeLong on the other, covering our coasts as well as uh, our, a little bit of this political spectrum. Uh, and in both, there's a basic skepticism toward the idea that the very sharp increase in inequality that we've seen, particularly, as I'll note in a moment, the increase that's concentrated at the very top of the economic ladder uh, can be linked back to politics and public policy. And that skepticism, I think, flows from um, the fact that it actually turns out to require three difficult steps to move from the observed economic outcomes that I'll talk about in a moment uh, back to politics. Uh, the first is, of course, to identify the relevant outcomes themselves, and I'll say more about that in a moment. The second is to plausibly link those outcomes to public policies. And the third, of course, is to link those policies back to politics. Uh, the way we describe it uh, when we speak to, to broad audiences about this is that we really have a puzzle wrapped inside a riddle, uh, wrapped inside a mystery. The puzzle is why we've seen this a massive increase in inequality of a certain sort. The, what we call winner-take-all inequality, where the gains are highly concentrated at the very top of the income distribution. Uh, the second puzzle and, is why or how uh, this was driven, if it was, by government policy. And we argue that it was. It was driven by what our leaders did and, importantly, what they didn't do, uh, by how they redistributed income through public uh, programs and tax policy, but also how they remade markets, uh, an important uh, uh, point that we, we tried to, to drive home. Uh, 
And the mystery, of course, is how all this happened in our uh, constitutional democracy, the, nation, the, the world's oldest. Uh, a nation in which the vast middle class has always been supposed to have tremendous political sway. So what I want to do is talk a bit about these first two puzzles. Uh, what's the outcome? And how is it linked to policy? What's the case that we make? And I'm going to leave it to Paul to take on the great mystery of how this has happened in our democracy. In talking about the changes in inequality, I think we're often tempted uh, to look at this as sort of a pulling away, uh, pulling apart of the income distribution, as if the rungs on the income economic ladder have just grown farther apart, uh, more or less evenly. Um, that's the figure, that's the, the image that comes out, for example, of the recent Census Bureau uh, report, which suggests that the, uh, even in the midst of the recession, the top 20% have increased their share of total income to about half um, in the last year. Now, when you start to unpack this, as most of you know, what becomes clear is that the gains are much more concentrated than that. It's not the top 20%, say the college educated who are pulling away from the rest, but really the top 1% who are pulling away uh, from uh, the rest of society. And it, indeed, when you start to look within the top 1%, it's the top one-tenth of 1%, the top one-hundredth of 1%. We've all seen the uh, data from uh, Piketty and Saez, which, is, uh, which has provoked so much uh, interest and um, some controversy. But the evidence that we draw on most heavily in the book is the Congressional Budget Office's uh, comprehensive income data, which is very good at, in particular at capturing middle class incomes because it includes government uh, taxes uh, and benefits as well as an attempt at least to include private non-cash benefits like health insurance and pensions. And the story that this data tells is pretty stark. Uh, if you look back to the late 1970s, and the data now go through 2007, this is just through 2006, but trust me, the story doesn't change really at all if you include the most recent year. If you look back to 1979 um, and you ask what was the average income within each of these quintiles, as well as breaking out the top 1% uh, from the top 20%, you find that there were already very substantial disparities back in 1979, with the top 1% having an average income of around 300 to 350,000, as compared with average incomes in the $40,000 range uh, for the middle fifth. But fast forward to 2006. <laughs> this is this is a you know for those who've seen the Inconvenient Truth, I always want, want to pull out a a lift at this point to get up there. Um, <laughs> We've seen an explosion of income at the very top. Um, and in terms of percentage gains, we're talking about a, more than a, a, a tripling of the income of the top uh, 1%, as opposed to a 21% increase among the middle uh, 20%. Now, you can look at this in many ways. Most recently, the, the Economic Policy Institute calculated, uh, and, we, and they're very similar to the calculations we present in the book, that about 40% of all post-tax, post-benefit income gains went to the richest 1% since 1979, which they say is actually greater than the 36% share of total income gains received by the entire bottom 90%. Um, we also break it out using 2005 CBO data um, to look at the top one tenth of 1%, which is where the gains really are. And what we find is that the top 0.1% has experienced about 20% of all after-tax income gains between 1979 and 2005, which is uh, more than the 13.5% received by the bottom 60% of households. So a lot of numbers, but the basic story is the rise in inequality has been very concentrated at the top. It's been winner take all. Moreover, it's been sustained. Um, Bartel's book, which I mentioned up front, provides a very arresting argument for how uh, rising inequality has been driven by uh, Republican or Democratic presidencies. Um, if you look at the top 1%, it doesn't seem at, uh, at all clear that there's a simple partisan story to be told. Instead, something pretty dramatic happens uh, around 1980, uh, late 1970s, early 1980s, that causes there to be a sustained rise in the share of the top 1%, with these dips mostly driven by uh, asset, uh, asset price drops due to stock market declines. And um, if that's the case, if this has been concentrated and sustained, um, then I think it, it, it raises questions about some of the simple partisan accounts we would have. The fact that it's so concentrated raises questions about the degree to which we can explain this is simply about uh, the divergence across broad educational groups or skill groups that we've heard much about. 
Uh, also raising questions about this kind of standard skill bias technological change story, at least as it involves the broad middle, is the fact that the United States looks quite distinctive. We're not the only country that's experienced gains at the top 1%, but we've we, are the, we have the highest share of income going to the very top, and we've seen the largest increase since the late uh, 19, the mid-1970s in the share of income going to the top 1%. Now, the last point that I just want to draw out, and it's probably in some ways the most controversial issue at this point of understanding these trends, is, is that this does not seem to produce big gains at the middle. Now, you've already seen that in terms of income, the middle fifth saw a 21% gain. Uh, it's worth noting that about two-thirds of that gain is due to the increased work hours of families because this is household income and there's more likely to be turners in a household than there used to be, though households are also smaller, which, off which cuts the other direction. But the gains have not been very big at the middle fifth. Um, but there's still real debate over the extent to which this trend in the top 1% is linked to the, to the trends at the middle. And I want to talk more about that in the question and answer session. I just want to say here that this is not we do you not have to accept the view that this is simply a zero sum redistribution right that the top 1% gains are coming necessarily at the expense of the rest of the population to feel that this rise has very su substantial effects uh, on uh, the nature of the american economy and of our democracy uh, effects that can be felt uh, quite uh, plainly in the lives of middle class americans and we talk about some of those there as we uh, crawl out of the rubble of the greatest financial crisis since the Great Depression, we, we see that there might be very large effects uh, sometimes of runaway incomes at the top, especially when they're driven by the increasing financialization uh, of our economy. If, if there is a, a standard view uh, about these trends um, that is focused on the top 1%, uh, I think it's much more focused still on a kind of skill bias technological change story in which these top 1% gains have something to do with changes in financial markets or technology that have allowed the superstars, if you will, to really uh, leverage their assets, uh, by which I mean their human capital and skills, into big returns. And it is the case that the top 0.1% uh, has many people who uh, we might think of as financial uh, superstars, um, four in 10, uh, I mean, two in 10 are financial firm executives, according to recent research. But it's worth noting that in the top 0.1%, uh, about four in 10 were executives, managers, and supervisors in non-financial firms. And the most clear superstar story, which will apply to people probably in the arts, media, and sports, they comprise only 3% of the top 0.1%. So I think we have to be skeptical of the idea that technology and uh, skill, the skill story uh, necessarily can explain this, especially when it's quite distinct from what we see in other countries. But that's not, of course, to offer an explanation, an alternative explanation, and, and I want to just very briefly uh, lay out why we believe that public policy actually it deserves a very large share of the credit or blame, depending on your point of view for these developments. In other words, we're skeptical of the view that this is a natural market development, and we're skeptical not just because the United States has a distinctive pattern, but because we actually think uh, we can identify very important policy changes that help uh, make the rich richer, to use our uh, title. So let me make three quick points and then hand it off to Paul. Point number one, um, when we talk about the role of policy, if, when we see a distribution like this, we really have to look within the top 1%. If it is indeed the case that these gains have been highly concentrated at the top, then focusing on broad measures like the minimum wage, for example, or even uh, tax policy as it affects uh, the middle uh, and upper middle class is probably not sufficient. We're going to have to look right within the top 1%. Fortunately, on tax policy, and I get to skip my Smith quote, fortunately on tax policy we have the work of uh, Piketty and Saez to help us. And what they find is that the average effective tax rate has indeed declined for the top 1%. But the most striking feature of their, find, uh, their findings is the decline in progressivity at the very top, the degree to which it's the top one-tenth and one-hundredth of 1% 1 that have received the greatest gains. And just a note on this, in 2007, according to the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities, the top 400 taxpayers paid an average federal income tax rate of 16.5%, compared with around 30% in the mid-90s and around 42% in the 1960s. 
The other point we want to make is not only do you need to look within the top 1%, you have to pay attention to what we call market making, to the way in which government makes and unmakes market. And perhaps the greatest example of this is financial market deregulation. Now, we know that, f that financial market actors have uh, seen their incomes rise dramatically. This figure looks quite a bit like the share of income going to the top 1%, but it's actually from a study by two uh, economists at NYU who look at the relationship between, in red, uh, the relative wages in, financial, in the financial industry and financial deregulation in green here. The, the, they look like they're pretty closely related. <laughs> financial market deregulation was as uh, a puzzlingly a quite bipartisan affair, and that's something that uh, raises questions about how a political account would work. Uh, but lest you think that we just have statistical data here, I have an anecdote that I'll just share. Um, Sandy Weil said to the New York Times in a, in a recent piece on the new Gilded Age that we didn't, uh, Sandy Weil, of course, the former head of Citigroup, said we did not, uh, we, this has been an incredibly unique period of time, the last 25 years. We did not rely on somebody else to build what we built. So it's worth noting that Sandy Weil has a trophy of sorts in his office. It's a huge four-foot plaque with a picture of him, uh, and it says next to it, Shatterer of Glass-Steagall, um, <laughs> i.e. Sandy Weil was a key actor in pushing back against, uh, pushing for financial market deregulation during this period. So apparently he didn't rely on government to, to help him, or, or somebody to help him, but he seems to have relied on a fair number of somebodies uh, in government. And finally, we argue that you have to pay attention to what government does not do as well as what, as what it does. And we use the concept that I developed in some previous work of drift. Uh, to elucidate this. Drift is basically the failure of government to update policy to reflect dramatic changes in society and economy that change the way policies work. And perhaps the most obvious example of this is the decline of labor in the United States, which is not so much a story of active policy changes, but of failed attempts to update labor law to reflect shifts in the nature of the U.S. economy. And we contrast the U.S. and Canada um, just to show that here's a country that has very similar overall uh, trends in many areas, but has, has not experienced these same kinds of, uh, of, of shifts in union membership. And we, we actually think that this is pretty closely linked to the ways in which the union policy was updated in Canada, but wasn't in the United States. Um, I will um, mention another story in passing, uh, stock options and executive compensation. Uh, executive compensation looks pretty similar to <laughs> the other figures we've been seeing. Um, and stock options are a big part of it, about half of it at the peak. And, uh, and here again, there was an effort, active effort by uh, Arthur Levitt, head of the SEC, to try to intervene, uh, to cut back stock options, which would have had, I think, a substantial effect on trends in executive pay. Here's what Levitt said after he was blocked uh, by Lieber Lieberman, Feinstein, Boxer, and others, uh, who said that, that this was not something that this SEC should do. He said, during my seven and a half years in Washington, Nothing astonished me more than witnessing the powerful special interest groups in full swing when they thought a proposed rule or a piece of legislation might hurt them, giving a nary a thought to how the proposal might help the investing public. With laser-like precision, groups representing Wall Street firms, mutual fund companies, accounting firms, and on and on, set about to defeat even minor threats. Individual investors with no organized labor or trade association to re represent their views in Washington never knew what hit them. So what did hit them? And now we get to the difficult mystery that I'll hand off to Paul. Thanks. Hit the B button and it'll disappear. At which? B. B. Uh, here, on this. Thanks. Well, it's great to be here. Um, and I wanted to start by thanking all the groups that were involved in putting this together, the Ash Center and the Tobin Project and the inequality program that I was involved in when I was here. Um, it is um, uh, it's especially exciting, I think, to us to have such an interdisciplinary group um, come together to talk about these issues because, uh, to me, one of our core messages is that if we're going to grapple as scholars with these difficult questions, it has to be an interdisciplinary approach. Uh, I've been complaining for years as I've shifted to studying American politics that political scientists who study American politics have no subfield of political economy. That is, the people who really think of the, polit the political system and the economy as two interconnected systems. Uh, international relations scholars, comparative politics scholars, political economy is 
really at the heart of the work that they do. American political economy as a field doesn't even exist. Um, and I don't think, you know, we're trying to sketch out uh, some broad questions and some preliminary answers to some aspects of this, but we really need a community of scholars devoted to developing a field of political economy if we're going to understand the kinds of dramatic changes that have been taking place in the U.S. Uh, another great thing about being at Harvard is uh, the candle power in this room. I see a lot of uh, longtime friends. I'm tempted to just turn the microphone around and uh, let people out there uh, start talking, but it is a, a, it's great to be back here and a reminder to me of just what an incredible intellectual community it is. Um, uh, among other things in my time here, it brought me together with Jacob uh, at the start of our collaboration that's been going on for quite a while now. And I was thinking about it uh, in the last couple of days and realized we've now written two broad books on the course of American politics. And in a way, it's really 600 pages about the Bush tax cuts. <laughs> um, we started working on the, the, our first book together, Off Center, really in response to the 2001 Bush tax cuts. Um, uh, which I think had two striking features about it. One was it was a landmark piece of legislation. Right? No, maybe the most important, at least up until the Affordable Care Act, but maybe even allowing for that. So the most important, but prior to that, certainly the most important piece of domestic legislation in the United States in the last couple of decades. Uh, the other thing that was striking about it and that got us going uh, was that when you look at that legislation and the policy design embedded in it, it's structured like a subprime mortgage. Um, or maybe more like a, a CDO composed of subprime mortgages. Um, we talk about this a lot in Off-Center and a little bit in this book. It is really astonishing uh, the way that this bill is, was designed, and I'll just be blunt about this, to bamboozle people. Right? Uh, to make people not realize how big the tax cuts were that they were voting for, or how they were actually being distributed. Right? So that middle America gets a nice check immediately, 300 bucks, you know, courtesy of <coughs> President Bush and Congress. Right? All the upper income tax cuts get bigger and bigger over time. And then you've got these weird features like that they, they're scheduled to expire, the, ca the estate tax goes down to zero, vanishes for a year, then goes back up to 50%. Paul Krugman famously called this the throw mama from the train provision, you know, because it creates pretty weird incentives when you pay no, no estate tax on December 30th, but on January 1st you pay 50%. You know, what's going on here? That got us going on the, on the first book. And now here we are, 10 years later, in the midst of the worst economic crisis that the U.S. has experienced in over half a century. Uh, we're still talking about the Bush tax cuts because the way the thing was structured, they're now scheduled to expire. Uh, and it turns out, even though Washington is saying we can't afford to do anything to deal with this crisis at this point, and if we're going to pay for uh, subsidies for small business, we have to cut food stamps. And yet they are going to pass hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars, many of them want to pass, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars of extensions for the top 2%, even though the trends that we've been talking, that, that Jacob was talking about have been going on. Uh, and just yesterday, 47 Democrats in the House wrote to Nancy Pelosi saying that they support that position of extending all the tax cuts. In a recession, you wouldn't want to raise tax cuts, even though the CBO, when they looked at this recently, said, they ran through a whole list of options of what we might do to deal with the unemployment problems that we're facing uh, and what would be cost effective. And tax, the, extending the tax cuts ranked 11th out of 11. And the high end tax cuts were a subcategory of 11 that ranked lowest within that option. Right? And here we are. And you might say, well, you know, government politicians want to do tax cuts. That's always popular. They're just pandering. It's an election year. But the polls do not show that. Right? The polls show if you ask people what they want to see happen, a surprising number of people say you should let all the tax cuts expire. Um, but a majority believes, a clear majority believes that the high-end tax cuts should expire. Right. What's going on? So what's going on with the politics? Uh, and I want to just take a few minutes. We obviously don't have time to do a, a full a full introduction to the book, but I want to give you a little bit of a feel for it. And I want to just take a, a few minutes to talk about really the theoretical architecture of how we approach uh, an analysis of the politics, right? 
we do this a little bit softly in the book. I think you can definitely see that it's there, you know, but, uh, but we didn't want to have huge literature reviews, that we didn't think that that was going to um, get the people we want to read this to read it. But, but I want to try to bring out, uh, for this conversation, bring out that, that theoretical architecture, which is there, but is um, um, you know, somewhat disguised um, for, for, this, for this audience. And I want to start uh, by just saying what I think the conventional view of how we should think about American politics is within political science, certainly within uh, Americanist political science, uh, which is you run everything through a media, median voter model. Median voters rule, all right? And I actually think it, saying that that's a conventional wisdom is almost too weak. It's almost an assumption. Right. It's almost an assumption. With, you know, and people have various kinds of caveats that they would put on. Nobody thinks that it works perfectly. But basically, the median voter is driving things. For reasons that most of us are familiar with, you know, I mean, the, arch the, the basic theoretical architecture, it's very elegant, right, about why that should be the case, right? It's a very strongly held view, and I'll just say parenthetically, we could talk about this more in Q&A if people want to. If you look at what I think are the two most prominent early attempts by political Americanists to talk about rising inequality. I'm thinking here of um, McCarty, Poole, and Rosenthal's book, Polarized America, and Larry Bartel's book, Unequal Democracy, both of which are very smart books by very talented scholars. Both of them essentially try to build an answer by working with the median voter model and figuring out how you can tweak it to make it consistent with the story that we're, that, of what we're actually experiencing. Right. And we argue in the book, and have argued in, uh, in other papers as well, uh, that that is just not the right approach. It is not salvageable. Right. Um, and actually, I would say in the case of Bartels' book, he ends up really concluding that it's not salvageable in a lot of ways, um, but then leaves you hanging. He sort of says, you know, voters are not driving the story for the most part. They're not really in a position to drive the story. But what is driving the story, and he sort of says elite ideology without really saying what that means or why we would consider that a, an, an explanation. All right, so the, the standard view, almost a premise, is median voters. Now, take a step back. The evolution of American politics actually experienced American politics, not theory of land, um, over the last 30 years has delivered two huge body blows to the median voter theorem, right? One is polarization, right? You really should not see the kind of extended polarization between the parties, um, not just at the national level, but at the district level, right? Not just in House races, but in Senate races uh, that, you, that you see in the United States. Uh, and McCarty, Poole, and Rosenthal's work on this, um, and also uh, Snyder and Salabaher and Stewart's historical work on this, I think, <coughs> Uh, bring out this point very strongly. Polarization is really hard to reconcile with uh, the idea that the median voter is driving things. And then secondly, the kind of top-end inequality that we're talking about in this book is also really hard to reconcile with this model because one of the, you know, one of the classics in political economy, the Melser richard model, basically says as inequality grows, right, as the top is pulling away from everybody else, the median voter ought to want more redistribution, right? So that's what you ought to see. And yet, as we demonstrate in the book, you see quite the opposite, right? Government's actually moving in the <laughs> other direction. Um, it's worth noting, just parenthetically, that, if, that comparatively, the melser richard model has never worked very well, right? You see government more actively engaged in redistribution in the countries where the initial income distribution uh, is more equal, right? So, where should we go? Um, we argue that you need a pretty fundamental revision rather than trying to figure out if you can add some um, epicycles, you know, like uh, what Ptolemy wanted to do to save the idea that the, that the Earth is the center of the universe. Rather than adding epicycles, let's try to come at it a different way. Uh, and we argue that the way to do that is to think about the organized. Uh, and their relationship to parties and policies, and then to voters. Right. Let's try putting the organized in the center rather than voters. I'll come back to this, uh, but I'll say um, that's not to say that voters don't matter or that elections don't matter. We think they matter a lot, but they matter in interaction with a number of other forces that modify the role that they play. 
Um, this move uh, is in keeping with some interesting, very interesting, both theoretical and empirical work in American politics on parties. Kathleen Baum, John, uh, John Zoller, David Carroll, to mention a few. Uh, it uh, echoes back to work by people like E.E. E. Schatzneider, forgotten work in American political science, but I think um, if you read it now, it will resonate. Um, comparative political economy work has long emphasized the importance of organization, group power uh, in politics. All right, why groups? Groups can mobilize and target resources. They can coordinate their activities. They can coordinate the activities of large numbers of people. They can gather expertise, which is incredibly important as the world gets more and more complicated and policy becomes harder and harder to understand. They can monitor other actors in the system. One of the things that we really stress is that they're long-lived. Right? Organizations are long-lived. They don't go away. All right, we talk a little bit about the uh, famous case of the Tax Reform Act of 1986. Everybody thought this was this great public interest reform. We're going to get rid of all these loopholes and use the savings to lower rates, clean up the tax code. Wonderful books were written about how the system worked and it produced this great effect. But if you go back and you look at the tax code 10 years later, it's like that old that colony, that, the colony in Roanoke, you know, where they come back to Roanoke and it's like, where did the colony go? Like, you know. It's not there, they can't even figure out what happened to it. All right? In the case of the Tax Reform Act, we do know what happened to it. All right? We know that after the TV cameras went away and the politicians finished taking their bows, that the lobbyists went back to work, the organized went back to work, and they started adding the loopholes back in. All right? So now you have a tax code that is much, much longer, has many more loopholes uh, than it did before 1986. All right, um, so groups are powerful. Uh, they monitor and act in long-term ways on other act act actors in the political system. And here we argue critically that, that parties are extremely important in this, that parties play a role, and this has especially become important as the parties have become more polarized, which means that the parties become more powerful, um, that they, um, they basically act as brokers who try to give these powerful, policy-demanding uh, groups what they want as long as it's not going to hurt them with voters. Right? So there's potentially a trade-off. If they give too much to the interest groups, then they, it can damage them with voters. But as we argue in the book, there are a lot of ways, and as some other scholars have argued recently, there are a lot of ways to make that trade-off not as severe under many circumstances, especially if the voters are not really following what you're doing, uh, which is going to be true much of the time. So in this context, elections matter, but they're not everything. Um, they do matter. We're not saying that they don't matter. We're not saying that the two parties are the same. Uh, but we're saying that both parties have been affected by, and here's how I link, we link it back to what's going on in the book, by a profound organizational revolution that really took place over the course of the 1970s. But the trends that were established then have continued since then, which is that business got a lot more organized, and especially its capacity for collective, for more collective forms of action and more directly political forms of action increased dramatically over the course of the 1970s. My colleague David, David Vogel wrote a wonderful book a long time ago called Fluctuating Fortunes, which talks about, uh, talks about this experience. The only place where we part company with David is that David saw this as a kind of pendulum thing. Right? So business power increased, and then the pendulum is supposed to swing back, but it never did. Um, so there's a big shift in organizational resources. Unions are declining. Economic representation of any kind, this comes back to some of Theta's work on voluntary associations and the evolution of voluntary associations. The middle class presence in American political life is declining. The organized presence of those at the high end and especially business is growing. And then we argue that that basically changes the ecology of Washington. Right? So both the parties are forced to adapt. Imagine you know, we're all becoming experts now on uh, what happens when the environment changes and species have to run around trying to adapt in a hurry. Think of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party <laughs> as species who are trying to find a niche in a new kind of political environment that's related to um, a dramatic and, and to a substantial extent self-reinforcing shift in the balance of organizational power in American society. Right? They both adapt. They adapt in different ways. 
right, given that they're different from each other, right? So we do not say that the Republican Party and the Democratic Party are the same, but we say that they're both profoundly affected. Republicans in many ways are empowered by the shifts that are taking place, the beginning of the, the rise of top-end inequality, the rise in organizational power of business. Democrats, on the other hand, are, you won't be surprised, having watched the last two years, conflicted about how to deal with these kinds of changes. All right? And we try uh, in the second half of the book to show how, uh, how that plays out, how it leads into policy making, both, again, both in terms of what Washington does and very importantly, in terms of what Washington doesn't do. All right, so that's a quick sketch. We are sometimes told that this is a depressing story that we are telling. Uh, I don't think so. The depressing story is the economic determinism story. Right? The depressing story is the one that says, you know what? The world has changed. It's flat. <laughs> or it's flat in some ways and really tilted in other ways. Um, but the world has changed in such a way that if you want to run a successful economy, you just got to let these goods flow to the top. All right? That's a depressing story. All right? Ours is a difficult story. Right. Um, because it suggests that the, the barriers to policy reform and to political reform are quite formidable. And I, Jacob and I would be the first to admit that we don't have very clear answers about what to do about it. Um, but we think it's an optimistic story um, because you can change politics. You can change policy. Um, it's a problem, not just a condition uh, that, one ha that one has to accept. Um, and of course, the first step is to get the political analysis right. And I, and I hope at least in, in posing a strong alternative to the conventional view of saying, we have to assume that the median voter is calling the shots and that everybody else is revolving around that, um, we can at least begin a fruitful discussion about how to think about how contemporary politics really works. Well, let me thank the two of you for doing such a, a really a deft job of opening up this book and staying almost within the time limits. Uh, um, in the absence of any expressed preference, I'm going to default to alphabetical order and ask Orkan Fong to uh, be the first person to, to, to comment. Thank you very much. I thought you were going to go uh, geographically. In <laughs> <laughs> <It would be. laughs> um, no. <laughs> it's the chair's prerogative. Well. Thank you very much, and I really want to thank uh, Jacob and Paul for making the trip out here, but especially for writing Winner Take All Politics. It's obviously an important book that comes at a crucial moment in America's political history. As Jacob uh, opened the story, the book is concerned first and foremost with economic inequality in America, and it brings a mountain of data to show how the very highest tiers in the distribution, not just the top tenth, but the top percent, the top a tenth of one percent, the top one hundredth of one percent, have become much, much wealthier. For someone trained in political philosophy, sitting here in Harvard in, at the house that John Rawls built, it's somewhat of a novel idea to direct laser-like attention at the very top of the distribution because Rawls tells us we should be morally concerned with the, uh, the very least advantaged, but they focus on the very most uh, advantaged. And what we see there is indeed blinding. But why, other than schadenfreude or envy, would we want to focus on the most advantaged? Uh, there are two reasons. One reason is welfare, as they show greater redistribution would help those who are less well off. I think the real reason, though, is a second one, which is democracy. In pondering the question of how much equality democracy requires, Rousseau answered that no one should be so poor as to have to sell himself, nor so rich that he can buy another. From this vantage, the danger of inequality is not immiseration, though there's plenty of that, but domination. And the point of winner-take-all politics is that there is clear and systematic domination around economic decisions and distributive policies in the United States. Indeed, American politics is no longer characterized by the median voter rule, as, um, as Paul just said. Instead, contemporary America, in contemporary America, we might say that the median capitalist rules as both Democratic and Republican parties adjust their policies to attract money to interest. 
Paul and Jacob bring an impressive amount of data and analysis to bear, and I accept a huge amount of their account. Because this book addresses a popular audience, it isn't the place for drawn out examinations of alternative explanations. But here, maybe I'll begin by uh, asking whether they might consider a comment on three alternative or additional factors that figure less prominently in their account. Um, their account rests, rests largely on what power analysts might call the first pace, face of power, highly visible struggles that take place on the shifting and uneven terrain of institutional rules of political combat and that include the extent to which money figures into political campaigning, the rules of union organization and mobilization, and decision rules such as the supermajority requirement in the Senate. There's as an account of the political terrain, the struggles on it, and the resulting policies. But what about dimensions of struggle that are less visible? I'll have three in mind and I'll go uh, through them quickly. The first is the structural advantage of capital in capitalist democracies. This is explored most famously by Charles Lindblom when he talks about the market's punishing recoil mechanism that makes politicians hurt when they favor policies that go against the interests of market makers and large market participants. I think it was the punishing recoil mechanism that President Obama was thinking of in his 2010 State of the Union address as when he justified the financial bailout, though he reported that I hated it, I hated it, you hated it, it was about as popular as a root canal. But why in a democracy, if it's as popular as a root canal, do you do it? Maybe because of, uh, in part, because you have to please capital. The second is the role of ideology in political culture, of ideas at both the elite and popular levels. Gramsci distinguished between the war of movement and the war of position in politics. Jacob and Paul focus largely on the war of, mo of movement, visible political machinations in the struggle for political power. I cannot, however, think but a sh a dr the dramatic shift in ideology in a pro-market, small government direction has made a big difference. Just a tiny example. I'm working on a project right now on transparency around the stimulus um, and stimulus reporting in Massachusetts. Does anybody know how many jobs have been created directly by stimulus spending in Massachusetts? According to Scott Brown, the answer is zero, but he's incorrect. Just looking at the period between April and June 2010, 25,000 people in Massachusetts have re received a paycheck from stimulus funds, and that's equivalent to about 10,000 full-time jobs. That's not the interesting part of the story. The interesting thing is that people in the stimulus office report that they regularly send Governor Patrick and their colleagues in other states regularly send um, Vice President Biden reports of how many jobs have been created, but these reports remain largely unused. Why? Because stimulus has become a four-letter word, even as the top concern among many voters is employment. This is indicative of the importance of ide the ideological war of position. And finally, uh, Paul and Jacob offer a narrative of declension from the mid-1970s, and I wonder whether that time frame is either too small to capture the dynamics of renewal that have been forestalled, as they say, or so broad that it occur obscures moments of opportunity for reform. And I'm thinking here that political time might play a larger role, and I'm thinking of works like that uh, forthcoming book by uh, Pepper Culpepper on quiet politics. According to him, um, there are moments of opportunity for reform and pushback that are maybe greater than um, Paul and Jacob suggest when all eyes are on the economy, but when those eyes turn away, it's then that, uh, at, like the tax story, lobbying and business interests um, take over. I offer these as components of an explanation that maybe warrant further examination. I'd like to use the rest of my time, however, to focus on a particular tension in the book and it's this one. So one can read winner-take-all politics as 280 pages of determinacy sandwiched between 10 pages of contingency on either side. <laughs> Jacob and Paul are surely not alone here. Indeed, the, dominant explanation of, the domination of explanation over solution is inscribed in the very structure of our discipline's narratives. How many books in political science consist of hundreds of pages explaining why a problem got to be so bad, with just a dozen or fewer suggesting in the conclusion, suggesting what might be done about it, like all of them. At least Paul and Jacob offer some hope at the start and at the end of the story. In the beginning of Winner Take All Politics, we learn that trends towards inequality and some of the evident causes, such as uh, declining union membership, are not necessary because they're peculiar to the United States. Despite operating in the same technological and skills-based economic environment, patterns in Europe are sharply different. But 
at least for me, the central arguments in the book read like a line of dominoes tipping, one contributing cause falling inexorably from the one that preceded it. By the end of the book, one wonders what to do. Have a drink, surely. I plan to do that after this discussion. I wouldn't miss out on that opportunity with you. But what about after that? Join a union? Maybe, but that's a dead end because of employer antipathy and a raft of hostile labor laws and regulations since Taft-Hartley. Maybe I could work, some of those, uh, work to change some of the laws by joining an electoral reform or advocacy organization, um, but that was not going to work because it turns out that really the only kind of labor they need is lawyers, and I don't have a law degree. They'd be happy to have my money, but I know that the other side will always be able to contribute more. Maybe I should run for president. Maybe I could be the first Chinese-American president. <laughs> Swept into office on the wings of a popular movement, mobilized millions of previously apathetic and unorganized young people and moderates. But once in office, I'd soon realize that important influence over important issues like the uh, distribution of income and wealth is severely limited by recalcitrant political opposition and legislative rules requiring supermajorities to get anything done. I'll return to this possibility in a moment. Paul and Jacob, perhaps in an homage to Bob Putnam, use the motif of the murder mystery and ask who done it, who killed American equality. For them, the culprit is not the usual suspect of skills-based technological change, skills biased technological change, but rather the organizational dynamics of American politics. Perhaps due to my son's influence, I'm more given to the motif of the comic book rather than the murder mystery these days. So I want to retell at least part of their story in the following way. Who is it in the story that have shown, could have shown up to save the day but did not? Who is the Clark Kent that did not take off his glasses to become Superman? Who's the Peter Parker who stayed home rather than becoming Spider-Man? Who's the Diana Prince who did not show up as Wonder Woman? Thank you. <laughs> and ignorance due, no doubt, to the poor ratio of women to men on Harvard's faculty. But I digress. <laughs> So, could labor unions have saved the day for equality in America? Paul and Jacob rightly credit labor unions with securing wages and working conditions through struggles both at work but also in the political sphere. But they associate the decline of organized labor in the private sector primarily with legal changes and anti-labor legislation. Certainly those developments were important, perhaps even determinative. But there's also the possibility that organized labor might have fared better with a different set of political strategies and attitudes towards its membership. It takes a special kind of talent, after all, to go from the people who brought you the weekend, as Joel Rogers likes to remind us, to fat guys with nylon jackets and pinky rings. Americans labor to, American labor's strategy to reinvent itself uh, to, uh, I'm sorry, Americans' labor strategy to invest itself in protecting its existing members rather than organize new ones is well documented, as is the highly oligarchic and elite attitudes of many labor leaders throughout the post-war period. Efforts to revitalize the labor movement by organizing in new sectors came perhaps too little. Some say it was too late. I remember speaking with one of these insurgent labor leaders a couple years ago, suggesting that maybe in labor history there were moments in which the rank and file participated in thinking about strategies and um, political, perspective of the, <coughs> political perspectives of the day. He said this was an overly romantic reading of labor history and that the rank and file then as now want their labor leaders to be the knights who come to do combat to secure their welfare. But then I look on other efforts such as worker centers that are growing more quickly, less associated with organized labor, and perhaps they've been more successful because they operate in a more innovative and participatory way. Um, perhaps social movements and progressive organizations could have stepped in to save the day. Following Theta and Marshall Gans, Jacob and Paul rightly complain that many of today's secondary associations are advocacy groups that are check-based and have professional heads but few members. Perhaps, um, but there are social movement organizations that do not resemble the head-heavy checkbook member Washington-centered organizations. Consider, for example, the network of conservative Christian church-based organizations, politically active and efficacious to be sure, but less top-heavy, less instrumental, and more rooted in certain ways of social life. Perhaps the superhero could have been uh, the institutions of our democratic government. Instead of the wonderful product of a founding genius that enables deliberation and self-government, we learn from Paul and Jacob that our political institutions are quite the opposite. 
But the institutions of our democracy need not be as they are in Canada, Brazil, the cities of Europe, and UK under both conservative and labor governments. And even in authoritarian China, there is an enormous amount of experimentation with new mechanisms of citizen consultation, voice, and even empowerment, much less so in the United States. Perhaps political leaders are the superheroes who have shown up, who should have shown up. The last full chapter of Winner Take All Politics de depicts a beleaguered President Obama who is savvy about organizational politics and tuned to Congress, but who is severely limited in his reach because of Republican obstructionism and the power of moneyed interest in Wall Street and the healthcare industry. Earlier in the book, however, we learned that presidents lead meaningful change when they are pressed to make change by organized Americans. By Americans, I do not mean the 535 Americans in Congress. In crafting New Deal policies, Roosevelt, Paul and Jacob are reported to have, uh, report, uh, said evidently that uh, in crafting the New Deal policies, he says, fine, you convinced me, now make me do it. So strategies matters for presidents as well. The political strategy of our current president seems to be an inside game of organizing Congress with very little outside game that appeals to mobilize Americans to make him do it. Indeed, if the obscenities of his chief of staff, Rahm Emanuel, offer any clue, this administration regards those who challenge it from the left as substantially worse than moronic. Such is the conceit of the political cognoscenti. In this regard, the president seems to embrace a Schumpeterian elite theory of democracy. The people should be mobilized mightily during elections. In his recent Rolling Stone interview, he castigates um, those who are contemplating staying home. But once the elections are over, he and his skilled team of politicians and policymakers will take it from there. Thank you very much. This theory of government differs sharply from how Republican elites have behaved at least since Reagan. Then, as now with the Tea Party, Republican elites seem much more comfortable and accustomed to working with mobilized groups and movement who, movements who attack them from the right. Ironically, in this way, their governing style is less elitist. Finally, perhaps, the superhero that did not show up is us. Symbolic workers who enjoy a measure of material security in exchange, I suppose, for answering the questions that society wants answered and for offering some new perspectives. Paul and Jacob briefly discuss the realm of ideology and ideas is important, and they ri po rightly point to the rise of conservative think tanks, such as AEI and Heritage, as being important in this regard. Here's the tragic irony of ideological production in America. Since the 1970s, conservative philanthropists have been organizing mightily to influence the realm of ideas. It's been a twisted marriage of Leninist methods and Gronsheim strategies directed toward Hayekian ends. <laughs> In the ensuing decades, however, moderate and liberal philanthropy has shifted to a pragmatic, policy analytic, and problem solving style. How do we improve this or that social program or social intervention? The idea is that if they invent a better mousetrap, this is the irony, it will be recognized and taken up in the marketplace of public sector solutions. As a consequence, there's little philanthropic funding for a set of ideas culminating in an ideological counterweight. One might think that the counterweight would come from the ranks of political scientists and sociologists in American universities. With few examples, I think this is, with a few exceptions, I think that this has not happened. And this is not the occasion to rehearse why. It is helpful, however, to draw your attention to an article that commemorates the centennial of uh, the APSR by Lee Seligman. In it, he examines all of the articles that have been published in the APSR for. Um, a hundred years, and he says there's two categories, two, two categories of those he examines are policy prescription or criticism or policy prescription or criticism with some empirical work. Before 1967, these kinds of articles accounted for 20% of the articles in the review. After 1967, however, there have been exactly six articles published in these two categories. Not 6%, six articles out of 1,500. Lee says, if speaking true to, truth to power and contributing directly to public dialogue about the merits and demerits of various courses of action were part of the purposes of our profession, you wouldn't know it from its leading journal. If anything could have been different, that could have been. Would any of these superheroes have made a difference? Maybe, maybe not. Sometimes the Green Goblin gets the best of Spider-Man even if he does show up. It does seem, however, that political science is in danger of displacing economics as the dismal science. We should resist this trend by exploring possibilities and contingencies in a more systematic and thoroughgoing way. Given this broader trend, we all owe Paul and Jacob a huge debt, for they are forging an important path in political science by working on problems that are of urgent concern to all Americans and by doing that work in a way that helps them understand where they are and how they got there. I'm going to end here so I can have that drink, and after that,
I hope you'll join me in the effort to figure out how to make things better. Thank you. Uh, if you'd like to contribute to the Fung for President uh, campaign, there's a booth that's set up uh, just outside. Our final speaker, Steve Scott. Thank you. Well, I think it's obvious from the wonderful uh, presentation that uh, Jacob and Paul gave us at the start of this session that this is a timely book with important things to say about what has and hasn't happened in the United States, and with equally important things to say about what it means to do the kind of scholarship that matters. And uh, you know, I have a wonderful group of 16 undergraduates, mainly juniors in government and social studies, who read this book a week ago, I think among the first uh, to to think about it, and I think on behalf of them and um, many people in this room, I want to thank uh, Paul and Jacob for being models of public intellectuals who can master data and present it convincingly, who can engage the important theoretical issues in our discipline, but do it without putting their noses into mumbo jumbo. Uh, but to help us think as a democracy what is happening to us, what it means, and what we could do to change it. So this is a timely book with uh, key strengths. I'll just mention some of them beyond what's already been said. Uh, the first chapter should be read by uh, every American citizen, I hope. It's a vivid presentation of the income and wealth trends over the past uh, really 60 years and um, makes the case that uh, there's a lot of action at the top and that there's something that changed fundamentally around the 1970s. Um, the book talks about the way our economy and politics worked in broad brush from the 1930s through the 1960s to create a rising tide that lifts all boats, and many Americans still think that's the way things work or should work. But it's just astonishing to see the way after a switch was turned, things went to a very different way of distributing the rewards of our economy, even as most Americans were working harder and having less time for their family life. Um, it does an excellent job of showing us what we would be like now if the way wealth was distributed unequally but still more fairly between the 30s and the 60s had pertained in the recent 30 to 40 year period. And I commend you to the, the snapshots of uh, Richistan and Broadistan in the first part of this book. Uh, we need to get back to Broadistan. The historical sweep of the book um, and the focus on what government does and does not do, the content of it, when so much of social science just codes things in general terms as if it didn't matter whether it was a tax increase or a tax decrease. Uh, it's just tax policy in a lot of the studies. Um, so they're paying attention to what government does, how that changes over time, and what the fights have been at key periods. One of the most interesting things in the book, and you know, uh, undergraduates noticed it too, was that it's not the 1960s that's the big moment of change, but the 1970s, and particularly the way in which uh, business organizations, which have always been important in American democracy, and, and always probably should be, there's nothing wrong with that, but went from pushing for the concerns of particular industries or of particular areas of regulation to being able to coordinate and project political power in a unified way. And of course that partly happened in reaction to the liberal gains of the 1960s. This was not stressed in the presentation, but one of the advantages of a historical perspective is that you can see that politics is indeed combat and that gains on one side can sometimes be met and matched by a counter reaction uh, from the other side. And we are seeing that before us uh, in, the in the current two year period. Um, 
it pulls together quite a bit on what we know about the reasons for the weakness and the disorganization of the middle and working classes in this country and unusually for political science done by people in Ivy League universities or elite universities actually pays attention to labor unions, what has happened to them and what difference it makes not only for their own political concerns in a narrow sense but for the shape of the debate uh, for all Americans, including those who are not involved in labor unions. So all of these, and, and then finally, um, it has a lot on um, what Jacob calls drift, what I think is probably better called obstruction, active obstruction of, um, uh, of possible uh, changes that are being advocated by forces that might actually win the battles were it not for the obstruction and on quiet evisceration of the kind that undoes the gains uh, of a big piece of reform legislation bit by bit, bite by bite, invisible piece by invisible piece until suddenly it's something very different. Uh, so what could be improved uh, with such a wonderful book? Let me just say a few things. Uh, I think in many ways it's an agenda setting book that leaves plenty of additional things for younger scholars to do and plenty for uh, democratic organizers to think about. So in that sense it's the best kind of book. Uh, I think the term drift is uh, should 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 uh, d drift into oblivion. Um, <laughs> I know there's a path dependency here. Uh, I know Jacob came up with drift and he's written an APSR article about it and so it's going to be very, very hard to change it. But drift sounds like something that happens on a beach. Uh, very pleasant and, you know, with, with the wind and the sand. and. That's really not what this concept is meant to open up. It is meant to open up the fact that we have to look at things that might happen that are being proposed or fought for and are being blocked and things that are done and then gradually undone. Uh, so updating social policy is certainly part of that, but frankly it can be any kind of political outcome uh, that can be undone through a, a series of deliberate and coordinated steps to eviscerate and change the meaning of it, or it can be something that is proposed that is stymied and blocked very actively. It's, there's not, there are actors here and, and uh, mobilization and strategies, and I think we need to unpack the various processes that are involved and get clear on how to study them. Um, there is too little in this book, and Archon began to mention this, on the popular depth of conservatism. I mean, there's really quite a lot here on uh, how rich people and businesses have reorganized, how they have become much more politically strategic, one of how they've mastered uh, ways to use the primary elections and uh, the institutional rules of the Congress uh, to uh, block things or to punish politicians who would dare to talk about a compromise or a Republican politician who would dare to talk about a tax increase. I mean, the Club for Growth is a very deliberate and very effective organization for doing exactly that and we're having a lot of fuss right now about the Tea Party but it's really the Club for Growth that's about to walk away. Uh, uh, they don't wear funny costumes but they're about to walk away uh, with the prize. But that said, there is a lot of popular depth to conservatism over the past half century. Um, there is the reality that Christian right organizations, the National Rifle Association, these are not simply elite fronts. These are groups with real people, with passions, who connect to one another, who started really mobilizing in state and local politics and then linked up with some of these national forces. Uh, they are held together in the Republican Party in shifting ways over time. 
The Tea Party movement is a, it has a lot of grassroots networks in it, even if it is also being uh, selectively funded from a series of, of, uh, of entrepreneurs and advocacy groups. And none of that is organized through the Republican Party right now. In fact, popular conservatism in some ways is less disciplined and less knit together in Republican Party organization than it has in the past. And there are a whole series of tensions that are about to erupt between grassroots Tea Partiers and the Republicans and the rich who have a different agenda than many of the grassroots folks. None of that is in this book, and yet it has to be there to get to the thing that's left out in the end. You know, my class agreed with this, I think, on the whole. We all, we got through this, and we were promised that the closing pages of the book would tell us what to do about it. And we get there, and they veer off into political philosophy, or oh, I don't know. It's just a disappointment. <laughs> and probably they had to get the book done, and they didn't know the answer. But here's the thing. I mean, if we've got an organizational analysis of politics that tells us a lot about why one party became much more powerful than you might expect, uh, given its ideas and where the median voter might have been, and another party, the Democratic Party, uh, became conflicted. I think there's a wonderful accounts in this book about that phenomenon. Uh, then we ought to be able to go from that to some kind of ideas about what it would take to turn this around. Because by the time you finish the book, you see a self-reinforcing cycle kicking in here. And that's not that's without even bringing in what they don't do in the book, which is to study the American media and the way in which it has become both more fragmented and substantially, substantially captured by Fox News Network, which is aligned openly with uh, the uh, business forces and the Republican forces that they discuss, and which is creating a meaning universe which is self-enclosed for a large proportion of the American population. The research on the Tea Party shows they get all of their news, all of their news from Fox News. So they are not living in the same reality world as other Americans. Um, so there's nothing in there about what to do. And I suggest two things. More attention to the complexity of what has been happening among Republicans and on the right side of the spectrum to include ideology ideas about how the economy works that are maybe quite false but are very pervasive, and more attention to the organization and the shifting networks between elite and popular forces on the right side will open the possibility for exploiting, for those who want to, I'm not assuming that everybody in the room does, if somebody wanted to, it would open the possibility for exploiting the divisions that are there and are likely to be greater. because. If politics is about organization, disorganization, mobilization, demobilization, and shifting ideas, and it's all of those, uh, one of the principles I learned when I started my career and studied revolutions, which is nothing to do with America, really, was that they happen, change happens, when the elites are divided. So where are the division points that at least the Democratic Party wing of the Democratic Party, if not the entire Democratic Party, might begin to get some leverage on? Uh, the same way that the Republican and business forces got leverage on divisions inside the Democratic Party starting after the 1970s. So that's what I suggest would be the strategic implication of this book and it needs to be taken quite a bit further uh, to think about that. In addition to some of the things Archon talked about, about where the new energy and mobilization could come from that could, let's just say, give some confidence and spine to Democratic elected politicians who may feel conflicted about whether the right thing to do is to continue tax cuts for millionaires of billionaires or find a way not to do that 
so that they could enhance and preserve opportunity and security for the majority. I'm willing to believe that most of them would like to find a way to do the latter. It's a hypothesis, it might not be true. <laughs> but they probably will have to have some sense of a political forces they can work with to make that explicable to voters um, and pressure to do the right thing and resources to help them survive if they do do the right thing. You have all been sitting very patiently, and now is your chance to get in on the discussion. There are two, is it two or three, two, two, two microphones. Um, put up, raise your hand, and a microphone will be delivered to you. Uh, and what we're going to do is take a couple of questions. Two, we're going to try to take, say, three questions uh, at a time, and then have our panelists respond. I think there's one hand down here, and there seems. Okay, I'll uh, try it without. Oh, uh, well. We'll get it to you in. Okay. Um, well, as Paul said, economic determinism is very uh, depressing. But there's organizational uh, uh, determinism here, which is also kind of depressing. The uh, thing is that it's a very convincing explanation of uh, why things as they are. And when you have such a convincing explanation, it becomes quite difficult uh, to think of how they might otherwise be uh, or become. Uh, given your explanation of, of why Obama has encountered so much difficulty, my question is what possibility that explanation allows uh, for him to have pursued strategies different uh, from those he did, uh, those he chose, uh, strategies which might have been more successful or at least less politically damaging. Uh, you describe uh, two major strategic concessions to uh, the realities of organized combat, as you put it. Uh, one is the congressionalist strategy of compromise aimed at winning some Republican support and support from uh, moderate barons and people you call Republicans for a day, uh, just a, a good phrase. Uh, and the second one is uh, Wall Street strategy. Well, you don't call it that, but it's a strategy aimed at assuring Wall Street that the administration could work with it, and those two things. The corollary, corollary of those two uh, choices seems to be uh, the attitude to organization for America, for the mobilization. Uh, in effect, the failure to transform the remarkable mobilizing tool that Obama created in the election campaign into a grassroots force for mobilizing support for governing. Uh, these seem to, there seem to be a trade-off here. Uh, you, you choose the, the, the first two strategies and you definitely decide against. Well, that's what Rahm Emanuel said to do. Uh, Bob Kuttner uh, sums up Obama's choices another way. Obama could have pursued a Rooseveltian combative strategy, but he chose an accommodationist strategy instead. The strategies that the two strategies really are part of that. My question to you is really, did Obama fail to adopt a Rooseveltian strategy because he underestimated the intensity and power of the opposition he'd meet, or because he was temperamentally incapable of it, or whatever other reasons? Or did he really not have any alternatives? Who else? There's somebody right there. Every one on the panel today has talked about organization and how important it is to help the middle class become organized primarily through labor unions. As you both suggest, however, it is unlikely that labor unions will regain popular support any 
Kai soon. So my question is, what are alternative organizational mechanism, perhaps within several public sectors such as education that can help mobilize the middle class. One other, one other question and then let people start responding. My question is, uh, what's the role, is there a role in campaign finance reform in terms of sort of restoring our democracy and you think that that would be a issue potentially that would unite people on the right and people on the left um, as a vehicle to really um, restore some, there's so much money in politics, the Supreme Court I know is kind of a problem on this issue at the moment. Um, uh, but is there, uh, is there some, some mobilization or some vehicle that we should be doing around that issue that would help, um, you know, sort of better connect the actual desires of the voters to policy outcomes? Okay, let's pause here. Uh, Paul, Jacob, I mean, and Peter and Arkan can come in as well. But this is primarily your party. <laughs> okay, there is so much. Um, I thank you both for for those you know, really insightful comments. And I thought I thought virt virtually all the critical things that you had to see you had to say were were fair. I, I'm going to say a little. I want to say a little bit about grit, um, uh, which. Jacob may be ready to jettison his baby, but I, I'm not. Uh, I don't think he probably is either. But um, let me let me um, talk a, a little bit about Obama, um, and then um, the broader question of whether this is such a deterministic take. Um, and then and then I'll say a word about drift, and we can come back to some other things later. There's not enough time to to deal with all the questions. Um, you know, one thing I think it's important to recognize about the Obama administration is that if they had been right in their economic forecasts of what the consequences of the stimulus package that was passed would have been, you know, the mood in this room would probably be pretty different. Um, they were wrong, all right? So, but I, but I think it's, an, and, which, and when you're trying to make economic forecasts in an unprecedented economic climate, and things are moving in real time, which especially in this administration means really, really fast. Um, you know, you're going to make mistakes, and I think it, I think it's Im important to recognize that given what the smartest people in the room told them, they sh <laughs> they could expect. Right? They didn't think that it was going to be enough to get them out of the problem, but they thought that it would be enough that un unemployment would definitely be in a downward trend now, and it would be, you know, seven to eight percent. Um, you know, and the reality is, it's a lot higher than nine and a half percent, even though we say it's nine and a half percent. So, uh, I, so I just think that's important. You know, when we say shoulda, coulda, woulda. Um, it's important that we recognize that. The second thing that I would say, and again, this is pretty structural. We didn't talk about this in the talk. We talk about it a lot in the book. The contours of the contemporary American Senate are a huge problem for anybody who believes in activist government. Um, and that's both the way the Senate is apportioned which has gotten worse over the course of American history. Um, and the rise of the filibuster, which is, you know, which people do not realize. I mean, there has been a quasi-constitutional change in American government, right? You didn't used to need 60 votes to pass everything. Um, the combination of needing 60 votes for everything uh, even in a 60-40 Senate, which they had only for a brief period of time, and you know, some of the 60, mm -hmm. not so great as we talk about. Um, so it is just a huge problem when the minority has, you know, I mean, just objectively, I think they had enormous incentives to obstruct. And it's worked. Politically for them, it's worked. There's no question about it, right? So in the same way that somebody who was analyzing the progressive era or the early days of the New Deal, would have had to look at the Supreme Court and say, you know, this is just a huge <laughs> institutional problem. We need to look at the contemporary Senate that way. Uh, particularly the way, believe me, as somebody who lives in California, I know what happens when you combine <laughs> intense party polarization with supermajority requirements. You know? It's really hard to govern. Um, it's really hard to produce change. So, 
uh, you know, and I, and I think it's really interesting to look to zero in um, if, if one thinks, oh, you know, could Obama have gone to the people more? Okay, well, what would that have done to Olympia Snow? Right? Uh, Obama carried Maine by 18 points. Right? If you believe <laughs> what the median voter model tells you, right, there should, she, should have been, she should have had a lot of incentives to be pretty responsive the way that a lot of Democrats were responsive to Bush when he wanted tax cuts after he carried their states. Right? But that didn't happen. She was really hard work um, to, get, to get anything done. And Collins was too. Okay, but I, I'm, just, I'm just saying, the Senate is a huge, huge problem. And I think you know, one would have to, one can make the counterfactual argument, right, that if he had rallied the people, um, that you would have seen more responsiveness in the Senate. I'm pretty stuck. Um, on this broader issue of, of determinism, um, it is a pretty, it is a structural, it is a structural analysis. I mean, we think that these structures are very strong, um, but and and that anybody who wants to think about changing them has got to map out that reality and deal with that. One of the interesting things about the, I was glad that Theta picked up on the '70s story because I think that is an interesting. Part of the book is to argue we really need to look at what happened in the 70s. Though. And one of the things that happened in the 70s is you see this contestation where you're around a tipping point, right? Which is so that it, where um, there are people pushing for change, in this case in a conservative direction, a direction of trying to move towards a more neoliberal economy. Um, they're not yet strong enough to call the shots, right? And there are a series of pitched battles as they mobilize. And as they win victories, you see, at least the way that we, we describe it is, you see a lot of people making new calculations, new political assessments about whether they need to make new friends. Right? So the, the, the key pitched battle for us, which is the battle over, over labor law reform, right, comes after business aligning with some Democrats have blocked a whole series of other Carter initiatives. Right? And then they win a filibuster, right? led by Orrin Hatch, you know, over 30 years ago. Um, and uh, they win a filibuster, and they block labor law reform. And at that point, you, know, you, can, you can almost feel, when you're reading this stuff, things tip. Right? People start to recognize, you know what? The, the calculations we had of what the balance of interests looked like um, that maybe made sense two or three years ago when we thought Republicans were in disarray, right? really in disarray. We need to recalculate those things. We need to make some adjustments. And politicians sort of update and, and, they, and they shift their views. And I think it's very hard. You know, we clearly have gone through and are going through a series of pitch battles of that kind too. You know, it's possible that these kind of tipping points are only really identifiable after the fact, right? Um, because, um, you know, you have to see how people reorganize, make new assessments um, uh, in the light of how some of those conflicts play out. You know, maybe, maybe we are close, maybe we were close. And, uh, and, and in that sense, I think a, a book like this can overstate um, the importance of structural arguments. You notice I have not said anything about what we should do, and I'll let Jake talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to defend Drew, too. Oh, I wasn't. Okay, yeah. sorry. <laughs> I will say a word. I, let me just say a quick word about that, because here's some place where I really disagree with Theodore. Whether, whether the word is right and implies something about beaches, I don't know. Um, but the reason why we think this concept is important, um, and we actually have a piece in the American Prospect coming out um, about impending gridlock. Um, in a, in a week or so that basically argues that gridlock is not neutral. Right? There are a lot of people who think gridlock is neutral because it just leaves things the way that they are. Right? And what we're arguing is that, particularly with certain kinds of policies, that what those policies really mean depends on how they're embedded in some broader context. Right? So if that broader context is changing, right, and the, but the policy isn't, that's change and sometimes really big change. That's what happened to the American industrial relations system. That's really what happened to American financial regulation. I mean, there were important deregulatory laws, but a lot of what happened was you had this dynamic economy just run off, and the rules were totally obsolete. Right? And that changed things. And then they said, hey, you know, you need to get rid of those other rules because they're obsolete. Right? So, and they did a bunch of that. Um, 
but the, and that's the idea that drift, that drift is trying to capture, right? Not that, that yes, abstraction is important um, and, and it's related to what we're talking about, but in many cases to understand what's going on, you need to understand that important areas of public policy, especially having to do it with political economy, where you have dynamic markets that are changing, you know, they're changing all the time, right? If government is not active in revising what it's doing in policy terms, it is losing ground. Right. Yeah, but Paul, the story you told in the first part of your remark was of an attempt to update the labor law that was defeated. Exactly. That's not drift. Right. But a lot, no, it is drift. It is drift, Theodore. But when we say drift, and we're very clear about this in the book, we do not say that it is a passive thing that doesn't involve action. We say that people are intensely mobilizing to block government from doing things. But our point is that many analysts, and you will see the op-eds are already coming out now, that are saying, hey, you know what? A little period of gridlock, divided government, that's not going to be bad. It just means that nothing happens, right? Unless both sides can agree and you'll get, and then occasionally they'll agree and you'll get the nice David Broderite kind of, kind of solution. And what we're saying and what the, the concept of drift is designed to talk about is that is not correct. That is not correct. If the government cannot act, you are changing things. We are not at all saying that it is a passive thing that doesn't involve political mobilization. You know, and that's why when we tell the story about drift in labor, labor relations, so our story about industrial relations is very different than the standard lefty story that you get, which is one about PATCO and the NLRB. That's the standard story. That is not our story, though we think NLRB stuff matters somewhat. Our story is they actually, these unions who were wearing the pinky ring guys, they actually did try to change the labor laws. They knew that the labor laws were out of date and that they were, you know, that basically business was getting ready to do an end run around all this stuff. And they tried to change them and they lost, right? Nobody, no laws changed. No oh. laws changed, but policy changed the laws. Uh, I'm going to try to end the drift here. The time is drifting uh, forward. So, uh, Jacob, if I can just invite some other questions, I'd like to get some more people. Uh, there, were, there were more more hands up, and we'd like to get more people into the conversation. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Scotchful suggested that we try and get to the try and make sense of popular conservative ideology or affinity. Um, and uh, there does seem to be uh, a striking, uh, uh, a mystery about why, uh, uh, why large numbers of people uh, uh, are sort of actively support the Republican Party uh, when the results of Republican initiatives uh, do them no economic good. Uh, one explanation for this phenomenon is Thomas Frank's uh, What's the Matter with Kansas. Uh, I know it's been, there's been some criticism on uh, empirical grounds of some of his definitions and so forth, but, but I'm not aware of any other uh, uh, explanation of that scope. Um, do, do you think, are you, and if not, wh where, where to look for one? Let's get, let's get several questions and I, I just have kind of two super quick questions which probably have long answers um, one is is there a role that like especially when you look at this kind of question of why, why America is kind of different than other first world nations it, is is the oil industry uh, and to a lesser degree coal a, a central part of that story and uh, just a lesser question has uh, Congress and in particular the Senate uh, or the courts, uh, the the wealth of the those individuals is that kind of mapped or followed uh, these same kinds of patterns that you described. And the third, the, um, the title of your book, "Winner Take All Politics," suggests for me something else that for me is central to the whole this whole discussion, which is the very structure. Instit and this gets to the thing about uh, public financing of elections, institutional obstacles. The very structure of our electoral system seems to me to be engineered precisely to not allow any of the opposition that people have been, some of the people have been talking about. If you don't like the Obama administration's policies and you don't like the Tea Party, where do you have to go? Well, you can stay home and now Obama is making speeches saying, you're terrible if you stay home. 
It would be nice if there were somewhere else you could go. So, I mean, I'd like to hear if you could talk about that feature of the problem. Let's go one, one more and then... And then. <laughs> um, so there's the part, it was mentioned before about broad land and Richistan. Um, that was probably my favorite graph in the whole book. Uh, it's really striking, just those number comparisons. But I feel like it's only people in this room and maybe a slightly larger audience who are seeing those numbers. Is it possible, how do you think we could spread that information to all over America, maybe just that graph in particular? What, I mean, other parts too, obviously, but that was the most striking. How do we spread that? Because I think that, as Kevin was saying before, that could be something to mobilize people. Um, do you have any ideas of how that information can be spread? Let, let, let me turn back to the panel now. Well, I'll speak briefly, and then I hope that uh, Theta and Arkan can also jump in. Um, and there were four questions. I'm not going to go back to prior questions or comments. Uh, this, this is more than enough to bite off. And I, I want to just say, as Paul did, how much we appreciate the, the thoughtful readings of the book. And Theta does an enormously good job of providing lots of positive feedback before she, she provides her criticisms. And I appreciate that. It's been true <laughs> since I was her student a long time ago. Um, so what's the matter with Kansas? Um, that's the, the question that is the title of Frank's famous book. And it's, it's provoked a lot of uh, of attention and, and, and some ire. Um, our argument shares a few affinities with Frank's. Um, one we would say is th that he doesn't emphasize enough is how important the alliance that Theta talks about between the Christian right and um, the Republican Party has been in bringing in uh, new voters into the Republican electoral fold. In particular, um, there's a lot of research to suggest that the um, relationship between income and voting uh, partisanship has gotten uh, clearer over time with lower income voters more likely to vote Democrat, uh, Democratic um, and high income voters voting Republican. But the, there is, and that's true even among evangelicals. But when you look at evangelicals, they're much, much less likely to be, Republic, uh, to be Democrats. In fact, uh, I think one statistical analysis suggests that you have to have $50,000 additional income before you tip into the Republican fold, which is uh, given that's about the median income of the United States, it's a pretty, it's a, it's a pretty striking fact. So very low income evangelicals are, are, are much more likely to be Republicans. Um, we think of this as more of an, or, of an organizational alliance, but I, I would want to emphasize what something that Theodore talked about, which is that, um, that there are, that there, and there's a lot of research to suggest this, that there is actually strongly held beliefs about the role of government and economic policy uh, among uh, more conservative voters um, that reinforce um, their positions on social issues as well, um, and and that and that is something that we uh, that is something that we we talk a little bit in, in, about in the book, but I think bears a lot more in analysis. If we're thinking about research agendas, I agree with Theta that thinking about the degree to which the the broad conservative uh, the broad the breadth of the conservative movement is really uh, crucial. One thing I will emphasize, though. It's very hard, if you look at the long span of time, uh, to believe that there was a fundamental shift in American ideology of public opinion that coincides with these shifts and trends. And in fact, I think one of the, the nicest recent analyses of this uh, by Larry Jacobs and Ben Page entitled Class War argues, I think quite persuasively, that there's much, much more of a constant story of ideology with Americans being what they call conservative egalitarians, that is, both concerned about government uh, and, uh, and holding some very strongly conservative beliefs at the same time as they are very concerned about inequality, or, or not specifically inequality, but, uh, but more about economic fairness and their standing and the degree to which it's threatened by these trends. And it's that, it's the degree to which the Americans have multiple and conflicting beliefs that's really crucial in our account. And what we're talking about is the way in which certain aspects of, of, the, of Americans' beliefs are getting pulled out by organizations, and choices are getting framed in particular ways that have been very conducive to the policy developments we talk about. And, and that, I would just say more generally, is we really are not discounting ideology, but we are arguing that it is often used as a kind of convenient foil for explaining these trends and our convenient explanation for these trends. It, it reminds me of an Alan Greenspan's, 
Fan said his models of the world were wrong, um, as if the ideas made, made us do it. You know, financial deregulation had nothing to do with the lobbying by the financial interest. And what I would just say is that these ideas were not questioned in part because of the organizational imbalances we're talking about in the book. So I don't have much to say about oil and coal except to say that, um, that clearly the Republican coalition did have a very strong um, basis in, in a lot of these extractive industries. Um, and that was certainly um, manifest in the early 2000s. With regard to um, the electoral system, it's not very good as an explanation for the change, but it's, it does, I think, help us understand two things. One is there is a pretty robust finding, and, and uh, Torben, I don't know if he's still here, Iverson and his colleague David Saskis have very convincingly showed that proportional representation systems are more likely to produce policies that, um, that are egalitarian. But of course, this has been a constant, and it doesn't explain the sharp shift we've, we've seen uh, in the last um, 30 years. Um, and I think we, we also think it's, it's the case that Democrats have governed Congress and the presidency for good chunks of this period, and how they've behaved uh, is not in keeping with even, uh, even the, the, our, our own electoral system's uh, inherent incentives, as political scientists have discussed them, to, to cater to the kind of median voter. And, and so we need to think more about beyond the electorate and voters. And finally, uh, how to get these numbers out. Um, well, I mean, I, I think that, that one of the things to understand is that, and, and, we're, and this may get to Theta's point about change, is that just publicizing and discussing the, 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 the disparities we, we, we write about are not, is not enough. I mean, there was lots of Democrats in 2001 who were talking about the imbalance. However, the media wasn't picking up on it. It's notable we studied every story that had been written when we wrote off center on the Bush tax cuts. We only found six or seven of hundreds that mention the distributional skew of the tax cuts in any, in any depth. Um, but, but I don't think that's the primary explanation. It's not that the numbers aren't out there. It is true that when people are exposed to the numbers, it matters. We, we cite a survey the American National Election Studies did where it told people what the share of income going to the top 21% was. And while most of these surveys show that about, uh, I don't know, a third of people strongly favor uh, government redistribution, redistribution after this question uh, was, after this uh, statement was read about the actual distribution it was two-thirds in the survey <laughs> suggesting that uh, and and, it, and we also show that and this comes from ben page and and, uh, and uh, Jacobs that um, that the average response to the question of what a CEO of a large national corporation earns among Americans is five hundred thousand dollars, which uh, <laughs> which falls only a little bit short of the fourteen million uh, average income of the top uh, CEOs of Fortune five hundred companies. So I do think the data would matter, but it has to be linked to organization, as we've been discussing. And those kinds of organizations have historically been the ones that have really brought people into conversation about these kind of issues. And uh, and Theta, more than uh, anyone else, I think, has elucidated the degree to which that's uh, that's no longer the case. Theodore Archon, any final comments? We are yeah, I just want to say one thing about the importance of studying the, the conjuncture that we're in over the last few years. Um, and actually nothing that's been said in all of the time by any of us, including me, would help us to understand why the Affordable Care Act passed. We get a lot in this book about why it isn't good enough. <laughs> but actually, it's an extraordinarily redistributive piece of legislation as written. And if the people who wanted to change health care in a more democratic, small d direction don't understand that, you can be very sure that the eviscerators know that and are going to work. Mm -hmm. And the other big thing that's happening is the battle over tax cuts right now. Mm -hmm. And I think it's one where people could really stand to put their minds to it and to do some research. Who are the 30 to 45 Democrats? Who are the pro-millionaire Democrats that want to extend the tax cuts for the fabulously rich given the data in this book. Do they not know? Are they captured? Are they afraid they can't communicate with voters about what's really going on? I suspect much of it the latter. And that's how organization does matter. If you build a party for 30 years, and even an interest group community in the liberal community, 
where you talk about everything except taxes, where you never talk about why taxes buy things we might want. Uh, what happens when the crunch time comes? You're not ready and you don't have a way and that makes you more scared uh, uh, about the politics even when the public opinion polls show what they do show. So this is just an enormously interesting period to look at the processes that this book has put on the agenda uh, and uh, I hope people will do it because both why healthcare passed and what happens to it next and what's going on with the money? Follow the money. <laughs> Those are both really important. I think this book suggests that they uh, bear uh, careful scrutiny and analysis. And it gives us some but not all the tools, which means that for many of the young people in the room, there's lots more to do. <laughs> okay. So um, Paul and Jacob, in somewhere in the middle of their book use uh, my favorite quote about American politics, which is from um, a Republican kingmaker, I guess, from the good old days, Mark Hanna. And he said, "There's uh, in all my years of politics, I've learned that there are only two important things. And the first one is money, and I forget what the second one was. <laughs> um, I think the, the second one is people. And you know, addressing a couple of the remarks, I think campaign finance reform, the problem of money in politics generally is enormously important. That helps constrain the new terrain of, of American politics, huge forces of uh, money, moneyed, well-moneyed organizations, but that's only half the story. And the other half of the story has to be about people. And I'm not sure, I think, you know, studying popular conservative populist movements uh, might lend some insight there. I'm not sure whether or what the basis of um, popular mobilization might be of the middle class as an alternative to labor unions. It's an, an, it's an interesting question. I mean, everybody talks about the mobilization for Obama. Is that particular to a, partic uh, a political choice moment and a candidate? Or is there something uh, about that that's more generalizable to other organizing opportunities? I'm not sure. I, I think it's an extremely important question. And you know, the main reason that um, I'm not totally depressed after this discussion is that political scientists aren't, aren't very good at telling what the future holds. So I was having a conversation <laughs> with Alan Altshuler who just did a kind of recent review of urban, or of ur recently did a review of urban politics literature from the 50s to 1961. And it's a story of pluralist stability. Race is nowhere in there. And two years later, the whole world changes, you know. And so we just haven't developed very good tools to figure out where the sharp possibilities of change are. And so um, maybe, maybe there are some that we're not seeing right now. Thank you. Right, I think uh, this session was supposed to end at 6. And I'm not quite sure we want to end with, our, with our, our source of optimism being our very bad track record. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's right. Really, don't worry about all this because we usually get everything wrong anyway. Uh, um, but uh, um, well, more seriously, I want to I want to thank uh, our four speakers uh, for really tackling this subject, and to Paul and Jacob for 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 writing this book and uh, for precipitating here and I think in many many other places around the country some discussions of some vitally important issues. So thank you all for coming and thanks to our speakers. <laughs> <laughs>